Dimulai, Pak. Oke. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon to all, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear colleagues, dear friend, dear. <laughs> okay. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear, dear participant. Uh, today, uh, I'm on the rubber to stand before you uh, as a. Uh, as a master of ceremony of this visiting lecture. Today, we are pleased to have a uh, visiting lecture from University of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, from Dr. Safriza Binti Muhammad Sharif, uh, as a deputy dean of academic and technology, technology in University of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And she have a topic uh, about managing inside trade. Okay, uh, I guess uh, we will start the, the visiting lecture uh, for Miss, Mrs. Dr. Safriza. Uh, please uh, start the your, uh, your presentation. Okay, thank you so much, Pak Adi. Okay. All right, so um, before we start off, okay, uh, I would just like to uh, thank everyone uh, who's attending to this uh, lecture, visiting lecture. Okay, so why, uh, why exactly that I'm choosing this particular topic? Okay, so the month of October uh, is actually the Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So as part of that, I'm thinking, okay, it is, this is something that uh, we need to um, let all of the people inside any organization to be more aware in regards to um, what are their roles, okay, and also how they are supposed to be um, vigilant in doing the tasks, in doing the technology, uh, in doing the, the, using the system inside the organization okay and also so uh, this can become uh, something like for the uh, organization to take into consideration what kind of things uh, that they need to upgrade in regards to ensuring okay that they can minimize the risk uh, that um, given by these insider threats right so that is why this title is being um, being given okay for this uh, visiting lecture talk. All right, so I'll be sharing my screen. Okay, so can you see the slide? Okay, we can see in the slide. Okay, can you see the slideshow? Or yes, only... slideshow. No, no, it's slideshow. Now it's slideshow. All right. Okay. So, first of all, we need to understand what is insider and what is insider threat. Okay, so uh, an insider is basically, uh, sorry, an insider is basically anyone, okay, anyone who has or have the authorization or had the authorization to access any uh, organization resources, uh, the knowledge of these resources. So resources can be uh, in regards to information. It can be on software. It can be on hardware, infrastructure, uh, all the equipments within the organization, and also the connection with the people who are still working inside the organization, who's working inside the organization. So all of this, okay, um, anyone who have this kind of um, authorized access or knowledge, or had, meaning they are previously working there, okay? This is what we call as insider. Okay, so what does insider threat means? It means that any potential of this insider, okay, to use their authorized access to this organization's resources and knowledge, okay, to bring harm to the organization. So whether they, um, you know, uh, intentionally bring harm to the organization, or unintentionally bring harm to organization, 
it's still considered as an uh, insider threat. Okay, so that is the definition that uh, we are looking at for this particular talk. Okay, so why does insider uh, attack or insider threats is dangerous? Okay, number one is that these insiders, because they are working there or they have you know, been working there before, okay, they don't act malicious all the time. So it's very hard for us who does this monitoring to pinpoint that they are doing something malicious because they don't act malicious all the time. And their behavior is like normal. They are doing their job. They are doing uh, their task okay, as how they are requested to. And they converse with other people like normal. So they are just like you and me. Okay, so it's very difficult for us, okay, um, that does this monitoring, okay, to pinpoint who's doing malicious things, who's the insider threat inside the organization. Okay, number two, okay, is they are working inside the organization. So therefore, they know all the infrastructure, the processes, okay, where the uh, weaknesses and also where are the areas being covered uh, in regards to security okay, within the organization. So they know all the loopholes. Okay, so because they know the loopholes, the witnesses, so it's much easier for them to bypass the security measures, to bypass all these uh, monitoring tools that is being embedded inside the organization. Okay, so it's very difficult. Okay. Uh, for the company to identify or to detect that they are doing something malicious. And lastly, it's because they know the location and the nature of those sensitive data. So they know what is sensitive data, where it's being located, uh, who have access to this, because they are working there. They know all of this. So therefore, they know who to exploit. They know who to contact, who, whose account okay, uh, that they need to get the credentials in order to get access to those information. All right. So that is why insider threat or insider attacks is dangerous okay, to the organization. All right. So this is the consequences okay, when an insider attack happens. Okay, so as you can see, uh, there's financial loss. Uh, there's also loss uh, uh, among the customers, the stakeholders. Your reputation is ruined. Okay? People will say, oh, uh, don't go to that company. That company, you know, they have issues. Uh, even people inside there, um, you know, giving out uh, data re uh, regarding the stakeholders, regarding the clients. Okay, so don't go there. They can't be trusted. Okay, so they are ruining your business reputation. Okay, not only that, okay, they are compromising all those stakeholders' uh, data. So it's not just customers' data, but it's also including employees' data. It's uh, including your business partners' data. So anyone's data that's within your organization, within the database uh, that is being used for the business process, they can be compromised. And therefore, it will lead to not only for your organization, but the life of your customer or, or your stakeholders. Okay? Um, and then there's disclosure of trade secrets, meaning probably you have products, uh, that have been, you know, uh, registered for intellectual property, or you have products, you know, that is coming from your own organization. You develop them, you invent them, uh, design them, and now this information is being sold outside. Uh, it's being used by other organization. Okay, so it's disclosure of trade secrets. And because run uh, business operation, uh, and then your uh, loss uh, in regards to customers data um, and also customers trust, you will see that your share will start to decline. Okay, so therefore you will see the falling of your share prices, and not only that, okay, each organization or each country have their own regulation. 
And as an organization, you have to follow the regulation. So like in Malaysia, we have the Personal Data Protection Act. So meaning if any data breach happen, okay, the company will be sued. Okay, the company have to pay um, some regulatory fees okay, because they have jeopardized or they have, um, I would say, um, doesn't follow the regulation that is being uh, put in within the nation. Okay, so all of this will lead to what? Financial loss. Okay, so that is why, okay, it's very important for us to uh, really um, monitor um, and um, have like a good awareness training for all these uh, employees so that they know that, you know, they are not supposed to be doing certain things because that will be considered as insider threat. All right, so who are they? Uh, who are these insiders? So there are four categories of insiders. Okay, number one is what we call as the pawn. So the pawn is anyone within the organization, okay, who is unaware that they are being manipulated into performing these malicious activities. So they have no idea that they are being used. Okay, so someone probably asked, hey, do you know this password? I kind of like forgot about it. Um, can you please share with me? Or you can say, oh, um, Ali asked me to uh, get access to his system. Um, can you share with me his uh, credentials uh, so that I can get access to it? Um, it can be anything. So meaning you who, you know, you, you work with these people, okay? They are inside of the part of the, uh, the employees. So you work with them, you trust them. So meaning when these people is asking this kind of information, you don't have, you know, this kind of, why do they want this information? Um, you just like say, away, oh, you can get this information, this, like that is, and this is the username and password. Uh, go ahead and use it. Oh, Ali asked you to do that. Okay, go ahead. So, because we trust our colleagues, right? So that is why, okay, this, the pawn, okay, they are being manipulated. They are being exploited to part of these malicious activities. Okay, second is the goof. The group are people who believe that all the security measures, all the policies, rules, regulation that is being put inside the organization is a waste of time. It's, you know, something that they think that, oh, we are not supposed to follow this. These are all, um, you know, hanky-panky, all the top management, they just want us to do this. But actually, we are allowed to do that. Um, I'm, I have to use it, okay? I have the... Uh, privileged to use that, uh, even though they don't. Okay, so they have this arrogance. Okay, that feel that they do not need to follow those kind of rules and regulation. And even though like there are tools being put in inside the organization to stop you from bypassing to certain uh, URL or something, they find way get access to those URL. Okay, so for them. All these policies, all this regulation does not cover their part. Okay, they do not need to follow it. Okay, so those are the goof. Number three is the collaborator. So the collaborator are people who actually cooperate with the competitors. They cooperate with the outsiders. Okay, to commit the crime to do the these malicious activities. So they are ways there there are reasons of doing this uh, sometimes it's because of monetary most of the time it's because of monetary so someone comes to them and say hey uh, i just need you to take this um uh, you know print out certain documents okay and i'll pay you like what three thousand us dollar just to print out certain documents um so because of the money okay uh, you print out those documents and give it to them so they are your competitor or uh, maybe they are someone outside that you don't know or maybe you know because friend of a friend maybe or someone that you just got to know during um, some lunch date or you know some kind of communication that has been triggered and lead to that. 
But there are also scenarios or cases that these collaborators, they don't want to do it, but they are forced to. Um, this can be part of, like, for example, ransom or blackmail. So probably these outsiders or these competitors, they manage to get some kind of information about the employee and something that the employee doesn't want anyone else to know. So they blackmail the employee. They say, if you don't do this, if you don't print this kind of documents and give it to us, we are going to release this video on about you doing this, this, this. Okay, so that can happen as well. So collaborator means they know they are doing something. They are committing a crime. Um, whether they want to or they don't want to, if they know that they are doing this crime, uh, and they're collaborating with someone from outside, they are the collaborators, right? And lastly is the lone wolf. So a lone wolf is something, for example, like um, some disgruntled employee. So uh, this employee doesn't like his superior and he feels that his superior need to, you know, bring down to, you know, to, to, to make problems for the superior because he hates the superior. So they, he does something on the system okay, that can pinpoint okay, the mistake to the superior and the superior will be the one that got into trouble. So this is lone wolf. Okay, so they act independently and maliciously because of certain, um, their own personal gains. Okay, they want to do something. Uh, they hate, like I said, they, because of hate, because uh, maybe someone reported uh, them to the HR and they don't like it, they got to know about it or they pinpoint someone so and then they want to make that person have issues with the HR as well. So that can be a lone wolf. All right? So he, this kind of person, they don't collaborate with anyone. They don't have a team. Okay? But they are doing it because of something uh, that, that, that has, you know, that can give uh, uh, some some kind of um, for I mean some kind of benefit for them or something that for them they feel that it's a benefit okay so they will do it okay so those are the lone wolf okay so this is um, a video okay that um, created by Goldfish is a cyber security company and this tells you like um really like uh, shows you how these four categories of uh, insiders, okay? Um, let me play this. I'm sorry, no son, Miss Safrisa. Miss Safrisa, there is no sound on the video. Oh, oh, no sound. Okay, let me see. Sound. Okay, how do I make this? Um, oh, let me see how do I make this? Available. Sound, sound. Um, I'm sorry. I'm not sure how to to make <laughs> to make the sound comes out. Uh, optimize the video. Optimize, optimize for video when you just share screen. Okay. Uh. On the view, you can see under the under the, on the bottom on the screen, there is a option to optimize for video. Um, wait, where? Stop share. Stop share dulu. Mendingan, Pak. Uh, stop share. Stop share. Uh, di share please. lagi bagian bawah ada share sound di centang. Okay, sound. so I'm starting this again. Tell me if you uh, can hear it or not. No, no. Uh, you... You you turn off the share screen, yes, and and then start share screen, share screen again. Okay. There is an option to share sound. All right, okay. 
Under. Under checklist share zone. Under here. Checklist. Let me see. Um, where is it? I think I already put share sound. All right, so I hope now okay. it works, okay? Okay, try it again. Okay, so I'll straight here. Okay. All right, so tell me if you can hear or not. Yes. Jacob, Mary, Josh, yes. and Peter. Got some? Yes, okay. All right, all right. I work for the same company. Peter is a professional insider sent by a rival company to gather intellectual property. Knowing that Josh is angry over a promotion snub, Peter quickly befriends him and offers him a sizable bribe to share sensitive information. Mary leaves her workstation unattended while taking hour-long breaks, so it's easy to get access to her computer. With Jacob, Peter sends him an email pretending to be his boss and convinces him to send some very sensitive business documents, knowingly or unknowingly. Jacob, Mary and Josh have become the greatest threat to their organization. Jacob is an oblivious insider and it's easy to compromise him without his knowledge. By ignoring basic cyber hygiene and security protocols, Mary is a negligent insider. Josh is a disgruntled insider and financial incentive motivates him to harm his company. To help protect your organization and livelihood from malicious insider threats, follow these best practices. Ensure that all sensitive information is destroyed when no longer needed. Keep your desk and monitor screen clear of any information. When you leave a meeting area, be sure to erase any whiteboards, take all documents with you, and be careful what you throw in the trash. Provide access to critical data and systems on a need-to-know basis. Do not allow a complete stranger to use your computer under any circumstances. Insiders have the potential to cause severe financial and reputational harm to an organization. Being aware of the threats originating inside your organization is more important than ever. If you encounter suspicious behavior, report it immediately. All right, so um, there you can see there are the four okay, type of uh, insider. One who is the collaborator and then one who is the oblivious, who's like... Um, don't know anything okay and then there's another one that's the negligent and there's one that is a lone wolf who you know or, or, or the collaborator okay that that collaborates with someone in order to get certain um certain kind of benefits all right okay so um sorry okay so how do we um um, identify this uh, threat okay so we need to when in regards to HR okay when they get this kind of detection okay they need to be able to do some kind of investigation so during this investigation they need to identify whether this is an unintentional threat or intentional threat or is a collusive threat or is a third party threat Okay, so unintentional threats is someone who is part of like negligence um, or they accidentally sharing information without knowing. Okay, if it's intentional, it means that they are the lone wolf. Okay, they know what they are doing is malicious. They know what they are doing will harm the organization. So the effect of the um, say investigation and uh, from the HR will. Uh, this kind of information will determine what kind of, um, how we say, uh, what kind of things that we need to do to this um, inside the threat. Whether we need to take them to law, do we need to fire them, do we need to give them warning, send them to trainings. So we will have different type of penalties. Okay, so that's why it's important to be able to identify. The, this type of threats. Collusive threats is basically who someone who's like the collaborator, so they collaborate with um, competitors uh, to get uh, information about the organization. And third party, okay, so third party threats 
we, we don't have a specific type of insider for them because third party threats, they are coming from um, people who is our business partners. So they can be vendors, they can be contractors, uh, they can also be um, you know, investors uh, that uses the system. So they are people who doesn't actually work for the organization, but they have access of certain level to the organization system, architecture, uh, resources, okay? So they will be able to uh, be exploited or they are themselves, okay, who does this kind of malicious activity. So they are third party. So HR, if they identify that this is third party threat, so they and um, they cannot like have penalty based on our organization because these people they are not working for the organization, but they can take action in regards to legal action because this is a different party, different organization. So they can go for uh, legal action. Uh, they can also like terminate the contracts and everything. All right. So what kind of threat are we talking about? It can be violence. It can be espionage, it can be sabotage, it can be theft and cyber. So the first four is basically something physical. Okay, they are physical. Okay, violence uh, is like being hostile, like um fight, okay, or um calling names, all right. Um, so you don't feel comfortable working in the organization with this person, uh, you feel abusive, okay. Um like if you, you are being abused by this person. Okay, so uh, those are what we call as violence. Okay, um, okay, so Anissa, is there any question? You you raise your hand. Anissa Trihap Sari. I'm okay if you want to like stop me in the middle, if you want to ask question. Miss yeah. Anissa, do you have any question? Or maybe just uh, mistakenly Ac touch. Accidentally. Accidentally. <laughs> accidentally touch. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we go. Uh, and then we have espionage. So espionage is something that um, people who have, you know, um, spies, like for example, spies, they are part of the certain organization, uh, even nation, military due to political reason or financial reason. So those are espionage. And then we have sabotage. So sabotage is, it can be from competitors. It can be from someone who have, you know, who are disgruntled. They can sabotage anything, okay? Any projects within the organization. Theft is basically about, you know, that breach, taking information or even like physical, like stealing, um, devices, uh, so those are theft. Cyber is anything related to all these four, okay, but it is not done physically. It is done over the digital world, okay, in the cyber world. So they can be espionage, they can be theft, they can be violence. Um, it, all of those, okay, all of these four others, they can happen as well in the cyber world. So if it happens in the cyber world, even though physically there's nothing wrong, physically you can't find any um, type of like documents uh, on the person, but it can happen like they put it inside their OneDrive perhaps or Google Drive, or they are putting out like a lot of like sex harassment or abusive words on the uh, forum. Even though not organizations, but they put it somewhere else that can, you know, pinpoint certain people in certain organization, in social media, perhaps. Those are also considered as cyber for, you know, being abused and so on. So, the insider threats. Okay. So, how do we determine? So, as a company, we have to be able to manage these insider threats. So, one of the things that we need to do we need to be able to indicate who is the potential insider okay, that gives out this kind of threat to the organization. 
Okay, so we have behavioral warning signs and we also have the digital warning signs. So digital warning signs, uh, you can use logs to look at this. Um, so we have these, uh, you know, firewall logs. We have from, uh, for example, even Windows, your operating system, Linux, they have logs as well. So you can have a look, uh, have a look at these logs. So if you see anything like, for example, they are downloading or trying to access certain uh, amount of data that, you know, that's in, normally in their job description, they are not supposed to be downloading like gigabytes or terabytes of data. So why are they downloading or why they are trying to access, they access this kind of amount of data. So those are... Um, behaviors okay digital behaviors that we want to see um other than that we are trying to get access to sensitive data not just normal data but sensitive data and probably they are not uh, authorized to access this sensitive data so and they don't need this as part of their job description so why okay they are doing it so this is another indicator um, they are trying to access this data outside of their unusual behavior. So probably they have access, but um, normal situation for their job description, they're only accessing this for you know, a certain amount or a certain type of data, but now they are trying to access the whole folder or the whole, uh, the whole file, okay? And not just um, taking certain things that they normally do. So this is unusual, all right? Uh, trying to uh, ask a uh, request uh, for certain tools or resources that's not part of their job description. They are using unauthorized external storage um, like the USB or uh, external hard drive. Okay, so um, some of, the, of uh, some organization, they do have this kind of policy um, called as the uh, bring your own device BYOD policy. So this BYOD policy probably have certain kind of tools or rules being put in. Like for example, if you were to use the uh, your own laptop or you were to use a certain uh, external drive or certain external uh, USB, okay, you have to declare them beforehand before you can use them. So those is um, to ensure okay, that the people using it have authorized to use them. Okay, but not all companies are using that policy. Okay, they are allowing you to get access or to use the infrastructure, the environment, okay, simply as is. Um, like universities, okay, they are allowing students okay, to bring their own laptops and get access to the Wi-Fi, get access to the local area network okay, because you are a student. Okay, but how do we know that this student, okay, is not a goof? How do we know that this student is not a collaborator? Okay, so it's very difficult to monitor. So number um number five, okay, the unauthorized external storage use. This is, you know, uh, can only be done, okay, for certain organization, um, an organization as big as universities where you have a lot of students. And then you also have employees and so on. It's going to be a little bit more difficult to monitor, All right? And then we have network crawling or searching for sensitive data. So they try to uh, search uh, using, uh, for example, if you have um, subscribed to uh, Google Drive, okay, your UMC is using Google Drive. So someone is trying to find certain files. They are clicking at certain folders to see who have access to what folder. Okay, so this is uh, activity that we consider as a uh, indicator of insider threat. We also have data hoarding, okay, or copying files from sensitive folders, or emailing someone, okay, on the outside parties. Um, especially if those attachments consist of sensitive data. So that is why. Uh, there are certain um, company, okay, they have like a filter that when you send an email, uh, they will filter certain words, okay, and these keywords, 
okay, determine whether you are trying to send sensitive data or not. So this is one of the mitigation methods that you can use in order to um, filter okay, the kind of uh, data being sent out okay, using email. There's also scanning open ports and vulnerabilities. So this one, there's so many tools out there um, that's free, um, that's um, open source. Okay? And while they are inside the organization, they can use these tools to find out where is the open uh, Wi-Fi, uh, what kind of is being open okay, in regards to network. Like for example, um, normally uh, the kind of port that will open is like port 80 for HTTP, port 8080 uh, for, uh, for example, um, for HTTP as well, certain organization uses that. Port 443 for HTTPS, um, and then there's also like port 25 for email, uh, and then there's uh, other ports like for uh, file server and so on. So when they scan these ports, okay, there are certain ports that company need to close if they are not using it. Okay, so this is the task of a network administrator. They need to close certain ports that is not being used. Why? Okay, uh, they do this kind of scanning because they want to find what kind of port is being open because this port can later be used, okay, to create a connection, a backdoor to the perpetrator, to someone outside. Or this is to be uh, a way for the insider threat to get access when they are outside of the organization. Okay, so... They want to know okay, whether the organization, uh, they open up this port or not. Okay, so that's why it's important that we're interested to know what kind of port to be open, uh, what kind of services to run in this particular port, and what kind of port that need to be closed. Uh, we have like a few thousands of ports, network ports, so they have to know what kind of port need to be open and closed. Um, there's also logging in outside of usual hours. So normally working hours, 8 o'clock, and then maybe 6, 7 p.m., uh, probably over time and so on. So if suddenly over the weekend or suddenly during public holidays, someone is accessing to certain server, okay, or they are trying to get access to the local area network, but... It's a holiday, you know, it's not open, for example. The company is not open. So why someone wants to log into those server? So those are digital uh, indicators that these people, okay, they are behaving, uh, they are trying to get access. That's not normal, okay, abnormal behavior. Okay, so we also have behavioral warning signs. So behavioral warning signs is very much physical. You see them, you, you can view them, how they react. Example, they are trying to attempt um, certain access control. So meaning, for example, they want to uh, get access to the server room. Okay, so they have a card, but their card doesn't work for the, the server room. So, but they keep on touching, okay, the, the um, RFID reader. Okay, they want to get access to it. So this is a very odd behavior. Okay, they, they know that they don't have access to it, but why are they testing? And they are testing multiple times. There's a probability that they have different cards, uh, em other employees' cards, because they want to try to know and you know who can get access to that server room. Okay, that's one example. Um, turning off encryption. Um, there are certain organizations that use, for example, virtual private network. So virtual private network comes with encryption. So probably they will turn that off so that uh, no one knows who get access to the network. Or they are using uh, their own virtual private network. Um, or if the organization have their own encryption, okay, so they turn off this encryption as well. Okay, because they want to make sure that once being sent over, okay, to the 
I don't know, criminal or their own server, they can get access to it. They can read it straight away without you know, trying to decrypt all those encrypted files. Um, failing to apply software patches. So meaning um, companies stated, okay, uh, then we have a new patch for Microsoft or we have a new patch for uh, certain software. So you need to click patch. Okay, if this is done manually, okay. Um, so if you don't see certain devices not being patched properly, okay, so this is a, another behavior. Why they don't want to patch? Because whenever a patch happen, okay, it probably, you know, this patches probably comes in regards to security, it enhances certain security, um, or there are certain things that is being changed. So they don't want this kind of changes. It makes things difficult for them. So they don't want to apply all these software patches. Um, one mitigation method is to do a bulk kind of patches. So meaning the administrator, they, you know, they patch it up uh, automatically. Okay, unless the owner of the computer, they change the automated uh, patch to manual. So that one, they are the ones that are going to do the patch uh, on their own. So have to um, identify, have to see the kind of devices or other things that they, they don't want to allow, okay, to follow through. Um, like for example, patching and encryption. Um, there's also, uh, they are doing certain work in the office at odd hours. So normally they come at eight, they go back at five. But why, uh, you know, uh, the past few days, this person okay, keeps having overtime. Why uh, they are always at the office uh, after working hours. Okay, so this is something weird. This is something abnormal. Okay, so this kind of behavior, okay, you need to um, take note. All right. Um, you can also approach them. Hey, hi, do you, do you have like uh, multiple projects? Uh, why are you, you know, uh, working over um, office hour? So if you see them um, not being, I would say, nervous, okay, um, then you, well, probably he is working on it. Uh, you can also check with other, um, you know, maybe sup they are superior, whether they have, um, access okay uh, to use the of uh, uh, the office devices or um uh, the, the the infrastructure after office hour probably because they have like huge uh, projects and they need to have it like like really fast deadlines like really near probably they, that's why but if you um talk to them and then you see them being nervous they like suddenly um, like uh, closing the monitor, switching off the monitor, or they like suddenly they want to like, oh, uh, I'm going home now. Okay, bye-bye. You know, if you didn't come uh, over to talk to them, they will probably continue working. But why exactly when you come and talk to them, they are suddenly, okay, uh, I need to go home now. Okay, see you. So those are odd behaviors, right? Uh, they have this disgruntled behavior towards other colleagues, uh, they have negative behavior, um, and you see them violating the corporate policies, like for example, maybe certain company have policies stating that you cannot access to the social media, but then you see them accessing their social media. So those are violating the corporate policies as well. Um, uh, uh, they are on the phone for certain things, uh, they look nervous, Okay, um, and then they talk about they want to resign. So anyone who like suddenly wants to resign um, or having new opportunities, um, this is something that needs to uh, be looked over as well. Um, because if, if they are happy with their current work situation, um, they, they will not like suddenly say, oh, I'm thinking of quitting or I'm thinking of going over to a certain company. Because if they do, okay, 
um, then you need to monitor them and then uh, you need to like uh, you know straight away after they have resigned okay to close any accounts related you need to change their access okay um, and making sure that you know everything that they have authority over uh, when they are working there has been closed up meaning they are not allowed to get access to any of the system any of the software any of the devices okay you have to take back everything all right next okay so the indicators for hr okay this is in regards to you know finding out um uh, maybe um find out new um a new customer or new clients or new employees anyone new business partners okay you need to do some kind of filter okay so it can be in regards to finding out some personal indicators background indicators their behavioral indicators technical indicators um, their organizational indicators and also virus indicators so all these indicators need to be done beforehand okay so uh, we need to see whether they have, you know, something going on in their life, okay, um, that probably would reflect, okay, to someone who will um, take money, okay, in order to do something. Okay? So you need to uh, look at their personality. If they are someone who's righteous, okay, so obviously, okay, you will feel that, oh, they will not do anything bad or anything against the rules because they are righteous people. Okay, so you need to have a look at their uh, personality. Um, background is, you know, who are they working with before, okay, and whether, uh, you know, they have some kind of situation, um, like maybe family problem, um, any family members are ill, uh, so those kind of things need to be looked into as well. Um, and, and certain organization, they are also looking through the background indicators using your social media. So for students, uh, please make sure that when you post anything online, uh, it's not something that can jeopardize your future. Okay, because HR do, okay, do background, in, uh, background search okay, on your social media accounts. Um, there's also behavioral indicators. Okay, so this is um, before, during. Okay, so we need to have a look, observe their behavior due to the behavioral uh, uh, one signs that we see before. Technical indicators. Um, if they are using certain tools, uh, they are expert in that. Okay, so um, probably you need to do some kind of monitoring in regards to the tool that they are using especially if the tools is something that can be used for hacking perhaps uh, so that's why like for example anything related to um uh, I, i'm actually i'm teaching cyber security here in the unikl so there are certain tools that even myself are using okay um that if with ill intention can be used for something bad Okay, but you need to justify, you need to make sure that this is part of your job description. And the admin, okay, they are monitoring this kind of people, okay, because they have access to this kind of tools that can be used for malicious activity. Okay, so you need to look at the technical indicators as well. Um, the environment, okay, so meaning uh, whether they are people who follow policies, who follow um the um cultural um practices inside the organization or and even in the nation they um they are good people who follow rules and regulations of the nation so these kind of people that are that are you know we encourage to get into the organization but if we know that they are doing bad things they have bad records i'm not saying don't take them okay people do change but monitoring needs to be put in for this kind of people that have this kind of indicators 
to become an insider threat. Same goes with violence indicators. All right, so some example of what had happened. Okay, this is real case study. Okay, um, some of this case study, I think you've heard of it, some maybe not. So first one is regarding misconfiguration. So this is, um, it can be negligence, it can be uh, accidental, all right? Um, Pegasus Airlines, this is uh, 30 um, airlines, okay? So there's a cloud misconfiguration by the system administrator. So 23 million sensitive files has been exposed. It contains flight data. It contains uh, personal identifiable information from employees to clients, meaning people who buy flight tickets, uh, even the employees. You can see their pictures, their name, their username, their password, all there, okay? Source code from the electronic flight back software. So the company, the, the Pegasus Airlines, they are using this EFB software. So the source code of this EFB is made outside, is made to be seen by the public. So when they say cloud misconfiguration, it means that the cloud, instead of setting it to be you know, internal use, is now open for external use. Anyone who can get access to this cloud, okay, um, there's no username password, they are able to see all these 23 million data, which is like really, really bad for the Pegasus Airlines. So safety of passengers and crew members is compromised, okay, because people, you know, people can change the source code, don't know what will happen. Um, people will know, okay, your uh, financial uh, information like your credit card, your debit card that you use to pay for flights. They know when you are going to fly. They know your address. They can stop you physically. They can they can do a lot more things, not just digitally but physically as well. So therefore, not just because of that, they are you know reputation ruin and loss and everything but they are also being fined okay, uh, by the Turkish uh, law because of the breach towards their Protection of Personal Data Act. So the maximum um, that can lead to the fine is 182,000. So, and then crew members or passengers can also sue them as well because of this. Right? So how it can be prevented? Number one, regular backup because this is on the cloud, right? So we don't know anyone can get access to this, make changes like towards the source code. So you need to have backup for that. So you need to do regular backups, uh, employee training. So you need to train, you know, to make sure that your system administrator, your uh, all your employees, um, they are, you know, they are vigilant. They are, you know, uh, when they do work, they check and recheck and make sure that everything's right. Okay, so it requires training. So you need to train them. Um, and also to put in employee monitoring software. So see, okay, who's doing what, uh, who changed what, okay, on the devices that they are using. All right, so we do have like, for example, the endpoint uh, recovery, um, recovery and protection tools, ERP, so you can use that as well as part of the employee monitoring software. So they have all the logs of the system and they can give alerts in regards to any uh, activities um, within that endpoint that does not follow the uh, rules and regulations stated. But that's normal. We have also MailChimp. Okay, MailChimp, um, this is due to social engineering. So someone sent a phishing email okay, to the employees. So it just need one person, one person to click on the link provided on the phishing email. And therefore, 133 MailChimp user accounts have been compromised. Okay, so someone have able to take okay, the user accounts uh, and sell it okay, over the uh, dark web. Um, 
We are just not talking nowadays. They are, we are not just talking about dark web. There's also telegrams, um, chat rooms that is being used to sell sensitive data, breach um, data that has been breached, and so on. So yeah, so it's, it's not just on the dark web. It can now be on the surface, the the normal web that we use, right? Okay, so how should we prevent okay, this attack? Number one, use two-factor authentication. So not just using your username password, but you should also include some other authentication mechanism. So in authentication, we have actually three elements okay, that can be applied. Okay, number one is something that you know. Okay, so something that you know is like your username password. Okay, so that is something that you know. Uh, you can also apply it together with something that you have, like, for example, a token or, like, for example, the um, TAC number being sent to you. It, it's not something that you know. You are being given and you need to enter that. So that is something that you have, right? And lastly, it's something that you are, meaning biometric. Okay, something is you, okay, your face, your retina, your thumbprint, okay. Um, so those kind of things, okay, can be combined together in order to uh, employ this two-factor authentication mechanism. So not just using one. And then asking your employees to go to cybersecurity training. Let them know, okay, uh, let them be able to identify which is a phishing email and which is not. So there are indicators in regards to phishing. Okay, um, uh, we can do that later, um, you know, some other time, okay, for a different kind of talk in regards to phishing awareness. Um, but there are indicators that you can go through in order to identify, to, to see whether, or to predict, okay, whether this email that you receive, is it's a true email or if it's a phishing email. Right. Nowadays, um, a lot of um, people, even though we have filter, uh, email filters and everything, but there are certain scammers uh, that actually read all these uh, research papers. They know what are kind of uh, indicators that we know as a cybersecurity uh, people that deploy these kind of rules and regulation. So they make the, the way they write the uh, phishing email to bypass okay, the filters um, of the email in regards to phishing. So they are syndicate, scammer syndicates, they are actually smart people, okay, the top one. Yeah, only the one that's uh, deploying whatever, uh, those are probably someone just following um, orders. Okay, but we can have that later. <laughs> Um, there's also Twitter, okay, so uh, now known as X, okay, um, so there's like a, a spare phishing attacks happen. So this is somewhere in 2020, if I'm not mistaken, 2020 or 2021, before Twitter becomes X. Okay, so uh, it's a spare phishing attack. So again, similar to MailChimp, it's a phishing attack. A spare phishing attack is basically a phishing attack that is dedicated they have their own target of employees, okay? In MailChimp, they are just sending to anyone, whoever, and hopefully someone will click on the link of their phishing email. But a spare phishing attack is some, they already know who they want to target. So they send a specific phishing email to these people. Okay, so that's why it's called spare phishing. Okay, it's like spare. Okay. All right. So consequences, 180,000 Bitcoin has been transferred to a scam account. 4% fall, okay, in Twitter stock price. Okay, and it delayed, okay, the release of Twitter's new API because of that. All right. Um, and how can this be prevented? Number one, again, training. One, two, and three. All the examples given here, the uh, prevention is training. 
Okay, cybersecurity awareness training. Number two is using user and entity behavior analytics, UEBA. So there are certain tools uh, that can be used in order to do this kind of user and entity behavior analytics. Um, they are uh, looking at the digital uh, indicators, uh, most of them because they are tools, but there are also HR people um, that give training for super supervisors and you know, other colleagues in order for them to be able to identify anyone who fits to the behavioral warning signs. Um, and lastly is the privilege access management solution. So identify who have privilege for what, okay, uh, be upgraded. Okay, so that is why um, there's a lot of talks uh, since like 2020 regarding zero trust um, mechanism. So meaning uh, we do not want to continue having, a, um, I would say, a similar uh, username password, okay, that you already stored. Okay, so meaning you cannot store any username password. So for, okay, how, how does zero trust work? So it is very similar to, for example, um, let's say example, your Bluetooth. Once you have paired your Bluetooth, like for example, from your phone to your car's Bluetooth, once you have paired, anytime you open up your Bluetooth on your phone, okay, and uh, on your um, car, it they will straight away connected. They will be paired without being asked, you know, using the password and so on. So that is, um, I would say, the trust, a uh, device trust kind of authentication mechanism. So a zero trust mechanism is where you cannot save any credentials. They will not connect um, or authenticate um, your devices or yourself uh, straight away. You need to always uh, put in your credentials and normally they will use a multi-factor authentication for that as well. So it's a bit tedious work. Um, so, because every time you need to use your username and password or your, um, and then combine together with maybe your biometrics or combine together with, you know, TAC numbers and so on. But this is the best way in order to ensure, okay, that no one can misuse these connected pairs, okay. So, that's privilege access management solution. Okay. So this is another example. Um, so this is uh, in regards to financial institution, how insider threat can happen in financial institution. Anna works as a bank clerk and is responsible for assessing credit worthiness of customers. Her and her husband's combined salary is just enough for them to live comfortably, but they won't be able to buy their dream house if her husband doesn't receive a promotion. He has been told he won't be promoted and she doesn't think she'll get a pay rise either. This has scuppered their plans of buying a bigger house. When it dawned on Anna that no one ever checked the credit assessments and awards that she made, she committed her first crime. She created a new account called Excess Payments and told an unworthy credit applicant that they needed to pay a small amount into it in order to be granted credit. Anna started doing this for most application and used her access rights to transfer small amounts from elderly account holders. Over a year, Anna stole nearly one million from the bank, which she deposited in various accounts in various names, which she was able to create. The bank's poor security culture meant that her fraudulent transactions went unnoticed. Okay, so there are multiple things happen here. So one, the uh, Anna, okay, the employee, he, she knows all the witnesses, like for example, like poor access management, okay, uh, like people not checking the uh, access uh, checklist, okay, so, and and no one check about in regards to her creating multiple accounts, okay, so these are all the witnesses that the insider threat knows, and they exploit this in order to create you know, to create something, to create malicious, like fraud, in order to gain, okay, like in this particular case, monetary value. All right, so this is how, um, you know, how, how dangerous, okay, insider threat, okay, uh, within an organization. 
Okay, so uh, there's some other statistics here. Okay, so this is a statistic from Ikans. So Ikans is a, a service security company as well. So they did this kind of um, uh, together with Cyber Security Insider. Okay, so these are the statistics that we managed to find for 2023. So the types of insider threats, okay, we see that 71% okay, um, is compromised on the accounts. 60% okay, in regards to data breach. 64% uh, due to negligence data breach. And 54% is due to malicious data breach. So malicious data breach is quite low, if you can see here. Uh, a lot of the data breach that happen is due to uh, people being exploited to, to do the data breach, um, accidental data breach, or, you know, negligence. Uh, they feel that, you know, this is all, nothing would happen, uh, nothing malicious. Uh, what they are doing is, you know, it's just looking over social media. It's not something that, um, you know, supposedly become uh, an issue for the organization. But from there, okay, people can get access to their account and therefore, creating or downloading certain data breach from the accounts. And the compromised accounts and machines is due to um, not being monitored appropriately. Okay, so a lot of us, a lot of organization sometimes doesn't have a certain, how you say, um, uh, UEBA or having a, a entity, uh, entity recovery and protection tool. Uh, embedded or installed inside the system. A lot of organizations sometimes does not have a log monitoring system. Uh, like for example, SIM. Uh, so because of this, okay, um, these compromised accounts or machines goes unnoticed. Okay, and um, and they manage to only, okay, there's another statistic stating that um, a lot of organization, they only know that an incident had happened okay after minimum three months period of time so meaning after three months okay the incident had happened either it's from insider or outsider okay only then the organization got to know about it this is minimum most of the time it's not follow minimum they will go like six months to a year most of the time um a lot of these cases Okay, you will see that a lot of incidents, they are detected quite late. Okay, and a lot of things that could have happened. A lot of data could have been stolen uh, or, or being, um, you know, leaked to the, um, to other people. All right, next. So here we look at the kind of um, difficulties in regards to detecting and preventing uh, insider threat. Um, so you can see 54% of insiders, okay, they actually have the credential to access the network. 44%, okay, they, um, there is a leak, data leak, okay, because of using certain applications like OneDrive, like Google Drive, Dropbox, email, okay, 44% of application is being used okay, to leak this kind of data. 42%, okay, personal devices, okay, is being used okay, to access corporate resources. Our phone, okay, we are using it not just to call people, we are using it to do our work as well. So when we use this to do our work and we get access to our system, our organization system, we are exposing it okay, to a lot of uh, threats. Um, how many okay, actually uh, put in okay, antivirus on their mobile phones? Not many. Why? Because antiviruses are heavy. Uh, and most of the time for mobile, when you use antiviruses, they will be you know, a bit uh, increasing the temperature, okay, when you are using it. And sometimes if your um, mobile phone is like old version, okay, probably 
you will probably have issues in regards to you know storage, laggings, and so on. Um, that is why a lot of most people doesn't use antiviruses on their mobile phones. Um, the it, it, on your laptop, on your computer, there's no issue because the capacity the is is like a lot more. Your storage is bigger. Your um, processor is a lot faster, and so on. So it doesn't. You know, it doesn't affect much in regards to using antiviruses or updating it all the time on your um, laptop or desktop. Yeah. But we have to take note that now we are using our mobile phones to get access to our corporate data. And that becomes a challenge when you don't have any tools to do certain malware filtering, to do checking in regards to you know the kind of um, potential threats inside your mobile phones so it would affect your organization a lot that's why like 42 percent kill um 39 percent um more end user devices are capable of theft mobile phone is very much capable of being stolen it's very small um not just stolen sometimes you leave it somewhere and you forgot about it Insiders are more sophisticated nowadays. 35% have been uh, stated. 31% is difficult to prove any malicious intent. Okay, um, because employees have access to this kind of uh, system and sometimes it is part of their job description. So therefore, it's very difficult whether they have ill intention or not to use this kind of data. And 27%, okay, is the lacking of security in regards to whatever devices you are using, whatever environment you're using. For example, if you're using cloud. A lot of people just use cloud as a service, but they don't put in in regards to security there. A lot of people are using um, uh, devices okay, uh, on, on, for local area network, but they don't monitoring it. A lot of people are using BYOD, bring your own device, but they are not monitoring it. A lot of people allows the Wi-Fi to be accessed by anyone, okay, or have very, um, how you say, um, bad password management, okay, and allows people to get access to it so much easier. And this, uh, plus with lack of policies, how many have security policies inside the organization? Security policies can be a lot. It can be password policies. It can be in regards to incident reporting policies. It can be, so you can have like small, small policies. Okay. And, and a lot of organization doesn't have them. Or if they do have because of, you know, audit, ISO 27001, they will probably like only have it once and never reviewed never updated what with whatever changes inside the organization never being updated so there's a lot of issues in regards to um uh, that 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 becomes uh i would say part of the factors okay towards the detection and prevention difficulties of insider threats okay so um if you look at the insider vulnerability okay so we can see that 74% of these insiders, they, um, they feel moderately to extremely vulnerable to insider attacks. Um, sorry, this is organization. So 74% of organization, they feel moderately to extremely vulnerable to insider attacks. So meaning they have no idea whether their employees can become an insider threat or not, can create attacks okay, towards their organization due to, again, either malicious, either accidental, or negligence. It can be very, the attacks can be very. Okay, so that's a lot, okay, 74%. Okay, um, so this is another, um, I would say, um, uh, statistics in regards to profile. So we can see here in 2022, okay, credential theft, grew a lot okay 5.7 okay percent um 6.4 are due to malicious insiders 
negligence uh, of third party like contractors is 13.7. So if you can see here, negligent employees or third party, uh, uh, yeah, if this is partner, uh, contractors, um, vendors, they contribute the highest number of insider incidents okay, within an organization. All right, so how do we um, uh, say, so this is the impact. Okay, so before we already have a look at the dangerous, dangerous effects of insider threat, but what are those impacts? Okay, um, financial loss, loss of productivity, data theft, stock price drop, data breach, legal expenses, lawsuits, loss of physical assets, and it can also impact your employees' morale. Okay, because when they see a lot of issues within the organization, financial loss, it will impact your uh, morale of your employees. Now they will say, okay, I will not get any promotion uh, because of financial loss within the organization. Stock price drop within the organization. So it would severely you know, impact your organization as well. All right. So and then we see how to mitigate. The process is, one, you need to define what are the threats what are the uh, how to understand this threat? So that's why it's important within the organization to have an insider threat program so that they can uh, un really understand what um, the, uh, the the issues okay in regards to insider threat. You need to assess them, so you need to do an, a threat assessment like risk assessment. So what kind of threat can give a huge impact to the organization, and which one can be accepted okay um and then you do your detection and identification of all these threats that could have happened and manage them okay so these are the four uh, mitigation process that can be done all right so here this is how we uh we do the um mitigation okay part of the insider threat program okay so one you need to build them you have to be ready to build them you have the checklist you do risk assessment it's very important to do risk assessment because not all threats okay can affect hugely to your organization some threats okay or, or some kind of uh some of the threat the risk is not that high so when it's not that high there's a possibility that your organization would choose to accept those risks Okay, so that's why it's important to do the risk assessment. Estimate the resources because when you do the risk, ass risk assessment, you know which one you need to invest a lot more in regards to improve the security. So therefore, you need to have resources for that, like installing ERP or installing VPN, uh, having licenses for um, monitoring, log monitoring. Okay, so you need to have these resources. So how much is acceptable okay, uh, to be part of this program? You have to have support from your senior management. This budget must be approved by senior management. If your senior management doesn't see the importance of it, they be, you know, they would say, ah, no need, nothing happened. So we don't need to, uh, get all this budget for this kind of resources. Okay, so you need to have or you need to make sure, okay, your uh, senior management, okay, understand the consequences and also give support, okay, to have the insider threat program. And then you create a team for it. So you need to have people to do investigation. You need to have people to do the mitigation process, okay. Um, determine the insider threat detection. Okay, how do you measure them? Um, do you have like certain rules? What is abnormal? What is normal? Um, in regards to all the indicators, and then you have to know how to uh, respond. Okay, to this kind of detection of insider threats, you need to have a plan for remediation. You need to educate your employees. Again. Employees need to be included here because they 
or potential insider threat within the organization. So you need to educate them properly. You need to train them. And then you have to review your plan. You have to review the program. Any changes done within your organization, like for example, some of the team members, um, you know, uh, they, they change places or they change position. So you need to put someone else there. Or any changes in regards to policy or within the organization or act or, you know, uh, the nation's act changed. So you need to review back your insider threat um, program. All right, so how do we do this assessment? Okay, so first, identifying what is considered as the acceptable or not acceptable risk. Okay, so once you have identified it, okay, if this is considered as a high threat, then you need to do an emergency intervention. If not, then you will do a simple initial screening. Okay, you identify and you cannot identify whether this is a huge threat or not, then you do screening. So from this screening, then you identify whether this is high risk or low risk. If it's high risk, then emergency intervention. If it's a low risk, then maybe no need to do anything yet, as, you know, as of yet. Okay, concern unwarranted. And then you do proper assessment, find out, and do the management. So in the management, where you manage it, you have to always do the intervention. Whether you need to intervene, uh, like for example, stop uh, or, or do lockdown uh, within your system, or you need to um, do investigation, you need to make legal, um, find out evidences, analyze evidences, and so on. And then you need to monitor, continuously monitoring, and then get back to management. If the monitoring result doesn't show any good feedback, then you need to intervene it again. In regards to the con uh, concern unwarranted, you need to follow up. If there is anything that needs to change, then you need to go back for identification. So this is the process in regards to, to do the threat assessment. Okay, so the strategies, it must be holistic. It must um, not just system. It must look into the whole organization, the policies, the uh, management, uh, the personnel, okay, um, all employees, everyone, your 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 uh, stakeholders, everyone must be part of the um, management strategies. Uh, it probably would have different kind of intervention. You cannot just have one type of intervention. They will have like plan A, plan B, plan C, and so on. Uh, it can be short term, it can be long term. You, you must have a good communication. If anything happens, you need to communicate with all the affected stakeholders. Don't let them be you know, in the dark. They need to know their data is being breached, their data is being leaked. They need to know about it and they need to know that you have done things. You have done all these activities in order to ensure that this does not happen again, okay? Uh, it must be uh, engaging. It must, uh, you, you cannot have someone who's passive in part of the team. So you must have someone who's engaging uh, and um, committed, okay, to help monitoring the threat, um, the threat assessment or threat management. You have to have your team members. Okay, so CSIRT here means Computer System Incident Response Team. So it does not just follow in regards to incident, uh, the insider threat, but it also looks at all types of incident. Okay, uh, it must be flexible. The team must be flexible, and whatever strategies that doesn't work, okay, uh, you have to have a remediation. You have to. That's why you have to have a different intervention strategies. All right, so. Who should be part of this intervention strategies? Person of concern, organization setting, and potential target. Okay, so it must incorporate all the actions for these three categories. So organization setting is for how to, you know, to ensure that things that changes the processes, business process, and so on does not affect that much. Person of concern, maybe the victims. 
and what about the potential target okay or whether this information uh, if detection have been done earlier and they found out before data being leaked okay so you need to have a look at the potential target find out what's wrong um, what can happen later on uh, maybe uh, not now maybe like a few more days or for a few more months or a few more years if nothing has been done okay to remedy this kind of incident so that's the potential target so meaning you have to make uh, changes okay in order this potential target not to become a victim so process of mitigating involves mitigation people assets and behavior so when you do your mitigate mitigation process so you have to look at the behavior indicators you have to create um, trainings so that they are uh, pe your people know about it so meaning you have to know what kind of education that works either you need to do like normal training like a talks like this or you need to do like certain gamification or you need to do like um, tabletop training or there, there are so many ways to train okay uh, simulation is also one of them okay so these are things that you need to um to to, to put in as your mitigation uh, intervention all right and then your people you have to know your people you have to know their background you have to know their situation now before probably they don't have any issue but now they have issues they need money for example so you need to do a continuous evaluation of your people okay and then educate them look at your assets okay if you need to have um multi-factor authentication you have to put that in you need to look at all your critical data sensitive data where to put that who have access to it okay so all of those are part of your assets mitigation and behavior you need to monitor your people yeah how they behave it can be from digital behavior or it can be physical behavior so you can detect them based on their behavior whether they are violating the policies or they are misusing the services some people who work at the server okay this is real uh, case study have been caught because they are using the server to download movies server like they are really fast you know there's a lot of um uh, high uh, process being used in server so they are used to download from torrent for example okay so this kind of thing happen all right so misuse of services okay is part of the behavior that need to be detected and intervene uh, and risky behavior so you need to investigate okay. so all of this okay is a loop and this needs to be done this is why because this is why it's called a holistic uh incident response um it's, it's, sorry uh, holistic insider threat program because this is this mitigation okay allows you to in, intervene at any part or any areas okay when incident can happen and then you have to have your law enforcement involved okay because okay when incident happen okay there can be consequences that criminal violations have, okay is part of it uh threat of violence uh mental health okay people feel you know they are being abused so they feel um you know these kind of people who are abusive they don't feel comfortable working so those are mental health uh they are being suspended terminated um so any part that acquires you to get the law enforcement involved you need to put that in you need to put this in part of your mitigation process so that's why hr is one of the people uh, or, or department that works really really close to this insider threat um, program so this is an example okay of an insider threat uh, incident response plan so remember i said csirt computer system computer system incident response team so this team they create plan for each so this is an example of an insider threat incident response plans 
So they prepare, they have awareness training, they make sure that all the policies is there, uh, all the um, you know, process of termination, everything is, you know, the rules regulation is already done. That's preparation. And then detection. Someone um happened to put something on the social media. Someone put some kind of information uh, or act weirdly or uh, abnormally. So those are detection. And then you need to contain. Okay, so this is one of the um, tools being used. Um, the endpoint detection uh, and response, EDR. So they, uh, this is uh, how they identify any uh, rules being um, bypassed okay, within your organization, within your devices okay, for endpoint. So they look at uh, filters for your email. They look at your network logs. Um, so a lot of these uh, processes need to be contained so that um, whatever information that they are targeting can be stopped as early as possible. So, okay, contain. And then you need to eradicate. So if it's a malware, if it's some like Trojan that creates connection with their um, uh, command uh, CNC uh, server. Okay, so they need to be cut off. And we, we need to get rid of all the malwares. We need to get rid of all the back doors, for example. So those are eradication. And this can also include insider threat where these people, okay, they need to be terminated. Those are also considered as eradication. And then you do recovery, make sure you know have put in the new um, credentials, uh, access uh, management, uh, be updated uh, and then um, get all the evidences for legal uh, kind of um, I would say action later on. Okay, if you need to put you need to put in or you need to grab uh, the law enforcement to be part of it. So you need to have all the evidences um, being put uh, in a safe place. Okay, being collected um, and then you need to do report. So this report is important because why? It is for follow-up. So you need to see what has been done, who done what, okay? If there is any hiccup, okay? If there is any uh, uh, areas that needs improvement, so those is where report comes in. So this helps you to convince your senior management as well if you need to acquire new resources and so on. So this report is very important. All right. Okay, so this is the steps of mitigating. So this is like um, just a bit repetitive. It's a summary, okay, of all the mitigation that acquires, okay, for an organization to take into um, action when uh, handling with insider threats. Um, so log monitoring, uh, you track all the physical environment, you have, uh, you know, do the assessment, you do proper uh, training, uh, you look at the uh, employees, um, you have to respond to any suspicious behavior, digital behavior, physical behavior, uh, look from the hiring process until they are working. Um, those are the things that need to be done. Okay, so it's, that's why it requires a team and not just one person. Yeah, I think that is all. Um, yep. Any question? Okay. Uh, thank you for a very great presentation. And maybe you can share the presentation because it's very complete, very <laughs> uh, good. Uh, hey, I guess sure, it's sure. very interesting. I'll, I'll email it to Novita. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, maybe you can share it on the. I'll on share the, it here on okay. the chat. Okay. Let me see. Okay, where's the chat? <laughs> It's very yeah. complete. Uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, we have a question. Yes. This is from Miss Feli. Uh, he asked about the psychological and behavior factor. Uh, what are the key psychological, psychological and behavior factor that may contribute to emergence of insider threat within organization? How, how and how can uh, business effectively identify, address, and mitigate this risk factor in proactive 
and empathetic manner. Okay, this is the uh, I write it. I read it in the chat. Uh, um, this is a very good question because it's oh, it's about the personal yeah. because uh, it's not about technology, but inside the thread is yes. talking about personal. Okay, yes. maybe you have a question, a answer for this. All right. So um, that is why HR need to be involved. Okay. So when they um, they uh, make this kind of uh, rules, okay, and regulations in regards to uh, the incident, sorry, insider threat program, they have to look at the psychological aspect as well. Okay. So probably there are certain organization they will put in like for example some kind of uh, psychology uh, profiling, okay, some tests, psychology tests to be put in during the interview session. Uh, and also like um, having a, like maybe after two years or three years, they do some kind of um, consultation, supervisor, okay, monitoring, and then probably if they see anything that's, you know, abnormal behavior or anything, they will, um, put in the consultation with counselors um, so that we can know how we can help. Because in insider threat program, we do not want to find faults. That's not the main uh, issue. So what we want to do is we want to help the employees that, become, uh, that can become a potential insider threat to see the right way of doing things and so that they are not you know continuing doing malicious things or being part of this malicious uh is you know uh inside the threat so that is why um everyone needs to be educated and we need to continue having this kind of uh like not interview but um a monitoring process uh either emotionally or psychologically so we need to have like tests profiling tests normally so th those are one of the things that needs to be put in inside the inside the threat program. Uh, okay, uh, that's a very clear uh, answer from Ms. Safisa. And there's another question. In the light of increasing sophistication of insider threat actor and their ab ability to exploit vulner vulnerability, what role, what role does continuous monitoring and proactive threat Handing play in the posturing of organization defense against inside threat and how can business establish an robust incident response framework tell to this specific text? Okay, okay. I read it on the on yeah the, yeah I, I saw uh, okay. <laughs> I'm looking at it as well. All right. So uh thank you for this question. All right. So Yes, I know. When we talk about insider threat actors, they they are also you know they learn they know okay the witnesses so they become uh they create more sophisticated manners uh in order to bypass all these security measures that is being implemented within the organization. So one of the things that that is why we need to have a team, uh and we need to um not just having this team to respond to any kind of incident. But we need to have everyone within the organization, the employees, to be educated on how to identify any of these um, potential insider threat actors. So that's why we need to all work together in regards to this. So once any employee, uh, if, um, you know, they have suspicious uh, of certain behaviors of their colleagues, they should come to the um, uh, any of the incident response uh, as an incident responder team or the insider threat team members to um to tell okay to report about it and for that we are able okay the the team will be able to do their investigation and do their assessment in regards to that particular suspicions okay so that is one of the um physical monitoring like the normal behavior kind of monitoring but we can also use monitoring in regards to tools like um, I mentioned SIEM, S-I-E-M. So SIEM is looking at this, um, all these logs that we have within our organization because all our devices, they have logs. 
So we need to have a place that combines all of the lo these logs and allows us to do pattern recognition, correlation, and uh, and put in like certain tables in order for us to um, detect any of the um, abnormality inside the digital um, uh, digital monitoring and intervene as soon as possible. Okay, so we have to have these two ways in in order to have this uh, proactive uh, threat hunting uh, take place, uh, not just digitally but also physically. So and and that is why we have to have all of that inside our incident response framework. So mm -hmm. everyone will ha they have to know how yeah. to report, what kind of thing need to report, um, and then who should be uh, you know doing this uh, initial assessment. Who uh, is uh, you know, in the PIC for certain uh, incidents and so on. So it 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 is a, like a very um, a holistic kind of um, how we say system within the organization. So it it comprises everyone inside. Everyone needs to play a role. Okay. Uh... Okay, uh, maybe I have a question for me. I guess uh, sometimes people didn't know that they have become an insider threat because sometimes people just playing a game and then pitching program or maybe on the mobile phone and they, they, they didn't know, but suddenly everything is in chaos and we know there's a, even a bank in Indonesia, there's a one bank that get hack and get uh, stolen the, the data gets stolen that's that's maybe because uh, the the operator opening maybe a porn uh, porn or maybe a, a movie uh, what is called pirate movie and there's a lot of spacing a lot of, a lot of uh, vector and that on, on that program so uh, how we we train our our team or our our people our uh, 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 our uh, organization not to open that kind of program because uh, yeah maybe people didn't know they just want to maybe to upgrade their camera capability and then suddenly everything get chaos and uh, uh, so how we train our people to protect to prevent that kind of problem Okay, so first of all, okay, you have to have a proper policy. You cannot tell them you are not allowed to do this, you are not allowed to do mm. that without mm. having a proper policy. So a policy mm. needs to be established first. Okay, once mm. a, a policy has been established, they need to be disseminated so everyone knows about the policy and then train them about the policy. So you cannot just simply, okay, we have a new policy, nah, read. Cannot. You cannot just simply do it that way. Okay. You need to call them maybe batch by batch. You need to have everyone knows about the policy. Okay. And the penalty within the policy. So once they have this kind of um, uh, policy and training being done, so then they will be more, um, I would say, vigilant in regards to what they are doing is right or wrong. That's one. But you you don't do uh, training once in a year or once in a lifetime. No, uh, you have to have a continuous training. So you have like one training for um, telling them about the policy. And then you have to have a continuous training in regards to creating awareness. Maybe uh, like um, tell them like uh, this is um, okay, the new updates. And you have to review your policy as well. So it's not just one policy, that's it for, for every time. That's the only policy that you have. You have to review. And every time any new review, you need to create new training uh, so that they understand. And you need to have um, assessment. You just train, like give talk like this. I'll tell you, most of the people, they will just hear and then everything mm. gone next. Yeah, yeah. So you need to do assessment. You need to have certain simulation. Um, like uh, some simulation is like, for example, like fire drill. So simulation, right? Yeah. And yeah. you have that every year, every like maybe twice a year, once a year. 
So you have mm. to have something like that done as well. So that is part of the um training. So, but oh, it must be based yeah. on your policy. Okay. Okay. So the most important is we first we must have a policy first, and yeah. then we can uh use it for the organization. Mm. Okay. Okay. I guess is there any uh question from the from the attendant and for everyone who interest with the presentation miss afisa is already shared you can download in the meeting chat please download because that's a very important and very complete i guess we can open it and study it uh piece by piece i guess there's a a, a whole the, uh, I'm interesting about uh, what is called. Uh, I'm inter have interest about C S I R or what is uh, what is in the organization for controlling uh, for, for incident response. Yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. And there's. Uh, I guess I will read it again. <laughs> okay. I'm okay, teaching. Uh, I'm teaching this actually incident response. Incident oh, response. Okay, yeah. Okay, so okay. Mm. so like um our students they they actually like um. They do a little bit of uh, threat hunting. They will yeah. also like uh, use tools in order to uh, do log monitoring and see whether there mm -hmm. is any suspicious behavior in logs in regards to okay. inside the threat or outside the threat and so on. So yeah, and and policy they are they they are also being um thought on how to create policies as well. Like we don't use like huge policy. Sometimes I just ask them to do. Password policy. What are the password policy? Because even that um, can be like very simple and be complicated. So how do <laughs> yeah. uh, how do, do the organization? Uh, what are the things that they they want in regards to this? And then uh, awareness, uh, training awareness policy. Every part of this have you can create your own policy. Not just one big huge security policy. No, you have to have specific policy for certain um, areas okay okay i guess there's no more question from the attendance i guess we we already at the end of this visiting lecture and that's a very interesting topic and thank you for sharing the presentation so i guess this is the end of this eh, there's a question okay please Miss Devi Safitri, would you like to unmute? Devi Safitri, dear. Okay, Miss Devi Safitri. Okay, Miss Devi Safitri, do you have any question? Hello? Open chat, mungkin, Pak. Oh, I guess. <laughs> okay, I guess we at the end of the presentation. Thank you for uh, Dr. Safrisa Binti Moh Sharif from Deputy Dean of Academic and Technology uh, from University of Kuala Lumpur. And we uh, really have a, uh, have a great thanks for this kind of uh, presentation and hope it, this can be uh, useful for our uh, for the attendants and for the the one who watch it in the YouTube. Okay, I guess uh, before we close this meeting, we can turn on the camera for uh, for the picture. Miss Febri, can you? Take a picture. Miss Febri. Uh, we need a documentation. Okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. Bagi peserta yang belum mengaktifkan kameranya, bisa diaktifkan terlebih dahulu agar kita bisa mendokumentasi di hari ini. Ya, yeah, baik. Saya hitung dari satu, dua, tiga. Okay. Sekali lagi. Satu, dua, tiga. Oke, okay, thank you. Uh, saya kembalikan lagi kepada Pak Nuk. Oke, okay, uh, 
I guess uh, time to say goodbye. Thank you for again for Miss uh, Doctor Safriza. Thank you. Okay, again. thank you goodbye. for uh -huh. yeah. Thank you for uh, inviting me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Very interesting topic. Okay. Thank yeah. You. So if you want like a continuation, let me know. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All uh, right. All right. So thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye bye. bye. <laughs>